The Old Testament reading for this first Sunday in Lent is recorded in Genesis chapter 22. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of, of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the, wood, took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took his hand, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife, so that they went both, so they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built at the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God seeing you have not withhold, withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram. There was a ram caught in a thicket by his thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. The angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore, and your offering shall possess the gate of his enemies, and your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading is from James chapter 1. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. When then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth, to, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from, from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he... Of his own will he brought us forth 
by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. This is the word of the Lord. St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o you may be seated as we sing our hymn of the day.
from God our Father and from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text today primarily is from our epistle reading from James chapter 1, and in particular, uh, verse 17, where we hear this encouraging word, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Let us pray. These are thy words, O Lord, help us and sanctify us in the truth. Thy word is truth. Amen. I cannot think of a more fitting hymn to sing just prior to today's message than this hymn from Martin Luther, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. One of the more profound uh, verses in that, in that hymn, which I just closed, Oh well, which I just closed talks about how we cannot re we cannot fight against in our own power we cannot fight against the devil and expect to win. I mean that's my paraphrase, but rather God has sent us a champion to fight for us, to fight on behalf of us. And what an important thing for us to remember as we go through what we know as the trials and temptations of this life. We all have them, whether we want to admit them or not. If there is still air in our lungs and we're still breathing, we're still able to get up and take nourishment, as a former parishioner from a former parish used to say, every time I asked him how he's doing today, he said, I'm able to get up and take nourishment. So if we're able to do that, Trials and temptations come at us all the time. They describe our life. Sometimes when we get together with other people, if you think about it, we don't have to think very long, oftentimes our conversations start veering into the arena of the various trials that we face in life. Of, how, of the challenges that we faced this past week, or the problems that we had. All of this comes under the category of trials. Tri the trials may be things related to our health. It may be uh, in terms of relationships with other people. Maybe our kids, maybe our grandchildren. The trials that we have might be financial in nature. You get the idea. Trials come at us all the time. Yet who of us is here, who of us here is really, really is, is willing and able to talk about the temptations that we face? I know I'm not. I'm not about to disclose the temptations that I face, and I don't think any reasonable individual would be. Why? Because those temptations that we face are often very ugly. And uh, uh, it, it's a part of us, it's a part of life that we have that, that we really don't want to deal with. We wish it would just go away. Well, in today's epistle reading, James gives us the proper response for the trials and tribulations that we face. He talks about God and what God has done in the midst of our trials and temptations. Not only what he has done, but also what he is currently doing. And though it seems like we're in a wilderness during those times, James reminds us that the giver of every good and perfect gift is on your side, even in the midst of your trials and tribulations. And that makes all the difference in the world. So let's talk about the wilderness that we're in when it comes to trials. James deals with trials by pointing us to God and his purpose in the trials. Rather than pointing to the trials themselves, he points to the purpose of the trials. Looking around here this morning uh, and seeing 
your faces. Uh, I, I know of some of the trials that some of you have faced and some of the trials that you're still facing. It's hard to believe, but James begins this letter, listen to this, he begins this letter in verses 2 and 3 by saying, My brothers and sisters, consider it nothing but joy when you fall into all sorts of trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Now you heard right. Joy. Consider it joy when you can't get this infection under control. And it doesn't matter what the doctors do if it's only getting worse. Consider it all joy when your loved one is dealing with some sort of cognitive impairment. Consider it all joy, my brothers. And you fill in the blank. My brothers and sisters, you fill in the blank. I mean, I remember a time back in 2012, a very challenging time for, for me and for my wife, Tanya. Uh, over a, a three month period of time, thereabouts three and a half months, at the end of April, we, we get a phone call that my mom had died. Just a couple months later, the beginning of July, we got another phone call that Tanya's dad had died less than a month later, about a month, almost a month. The first of August, we got another phone call that my dad had died. Boom, boom, boom. And if that weren't bad enough, brothers that uh, I considered to be brothers in Christ um, had turned on me. Joy? Are you kidding me? Consider it joy when you encounter trials? Are you out of your ever-living, loving mind? That's not the word that comes to my mind. I don't know about you. That's not the word that comes to my mind when I think of that period about five and a half years ago. But that is exactly what James is saying to each and every one of us. And that is what verse 12 is saying to us, too. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. You see, God uses our trials to strengthen our faith. Now, when James says, when he has stood the test, this is not a, a, a word that we would think of in terms of school. We sit in, in school, we take a test, and we either pass or we fail, right? You know, it's either one or the other. That is not what James has in mind here. The word that James has in mind here is a word that has to do with approval. Approval. When he has, you know, it's a testing for the purpose of being approved. It's sort of like as precious metals, like gold, is tested by fire. It's not testing to see if it's going to fail, but it's testing in order to draw out all the gunk and all the impurities. That's the purpose of the test. So, so when he says, when he has stood the test, when God has done the work in him, in terms of making him holy and, 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 and righteous and good, when he has done all of that, he's going to receive the crown of life, which he has promised. No word at all that this test, no word at all is there suggested here in the grammar that this testing is geared towards seeing of whether or not he's made of the right stuff. Or, made, or whether he or she is, is going to pass or fail, but it's testing in order to, to make them strong, in order to strengthen faith. And that is exactly what God is doing here. Because when we are going through trials, God is strengthening our faith. You see, few Christians, if you think about it, few Christians seem to get stronger when times are going well. Have you ever thought about it? When things are going great, 
when things are going well in life, life is good. You know, there isn't uh, much in, in the way of uh, our faith being, being tried, is there? No. But it's through the tough times. It's the tough times that move us to run to and to cling to God. God does keep his promises during those tough times, during those times of trials, and he sustains us during our times of trials. And that is a word that every single one of us here needs to remember. Some of us deal with chronic pain. I know our brother George is in here today and hasn't been because of chronic pain. He was supposed to get this device, this medical device that, would, uh, that was implanted and was to go to the source of uh, uh, where his, the pain was originating from in his back and his spine and it was supposed to do a slow drip, drip, drip of the medication right at the source of the pain so he isn't all doped up all the time. And it was supposed to do the job. Well, guess what? It's not working. It's having no effect other than making his legs numb. And so he is going through a trial. I see our sister Diane here. And she too has been through trials with, with uh, uh, her back as well. And, and I see Sandy here. She too has been through trials. We need to know that God uses these trials to strengthen our faith. You see, he is the giver of every good and perfect gift. And he uses them for our good. He uses these trials for our good. Whether we realize what's going on or not is immaterial. God is using them for our good, and he's strengthening our faith uh, in, in his dear son. You see, our, his dear son, our Lord Jesus, knows all about trials. He knows everything there is to know about trials. He mentions in Scripture that he has nowhere to that the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He was arrested unjustly. He was put on trial, such as it was. He was flogged. He was, a crown of thorns was plunged into his head. He was nailed to a cross. A spear was shoved into his side. So he knows all about trials. He knows all about suffering because he has suffered beyond anything that I'm sure none of, I'm sure none of us here can even imagine. But you know what? He always had his eye on his heavenly Father. He always had his eye on, on his heavenly Father. In fact, the author of Hebrews puts it like this to us as we suffer trials. He said, we need to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and despised the shame. So Jesus knows all about that. And Jesus always kept his eyes on his heavenly Father is he trusting him that he was going to sustain him? We saw how our Lord sustained him when he was in the wilderness in our gospel reading today, being tempted by the devil, and afterwards he sent the, his angels to come and minister to him. But you know what? In our times of trial, here's what's going to happen, and here's what does happen. The devil comes around, and he's always close at hand, and what does the devil do? He is now tempting us in the midst of our trial. He is trying to tempt us to look away from God. He is trying to tempt us not to look to Jesus. Instead, he is trying to tempt us to take matters into our own hands. Instead of trusting God to work all things together for good for us. And that's exactly what the devil 
does not want to happen. He does not want us to look to Jesus. He does not want us to look to our Heavenly Father to, and trust Him for those things. Instead, He wants us to look to ourselves. He wants us to look to the advice of other people. He'll do, he'll do, he won't stop at anything to stop us from praying. But we always must remember that in the midst of this, that Jesus is there with us every step of the way. Even when it seems like you're all alone in a wilderness. And I've been there. But even though we feel that way, or how we feel matters nothing. Matters not. Because the reality is, is Jesus is with us, whether we feel him or not. In fact, he says, I will never leave you. And I will never forsake you. I'm with you always. And not only is he always with us in the wilderness, he knows exactly what we're going through. And he is able to sympathize with you because he knows what you're going through. He understands pain. He understands heartache. He understands all of the things that we go through. And he is able to sympathize with us like no one has ever been able to sympathize with us before. He is the only one who gives you a strengthened faith through it all. He's the only one who can bring us through the trials of this life and give us everlasting life. The crown of life is yours, my friends. The crown of life is yours because our dear Savior, Jesus Christ, suffered the trials of Calvary for you and me. And so the next time you're going through a trial, or even in the midst of your current trial you're in now, remember Jesus, your Savior. Look to him. When you wonder where God is in the midst of your suffering, look to the cross. He's there to give you his comfort, his understanding, his power, and his victory. Go to his word. He's, he'll speak to you there, regardless of what the current news pundits say today. God does speak to us in his word. That's not a mental illness as some would have us believe today. Go to his table, as will come in a few minutes, and receive his body and blood. And through these things you will be strengthened. That's the wilderness of our trials. What about the wilderness of temptations? Well, the first thing we need to recall, that we need to know, is that our temptations are not God's fault. Whatever they are, they are not God's doing. We'd like to blame God for this. I mean, after all, isn't he the one that gave us desires, that created us with certain desires in the first place? Well, perhaps so. He did, you know, he did give us those desires, but what he did not do is he did not create us to abuse those desires. He did not create us to overindulge or whatever the case might be. That came later on from someone else. So whether we like it or not, we cannot, nor must we never, nor must we never. That doesn't quite make sense. But we must never blame God, ever blame God for the temptations or for falling into temptation or for giving in to the temptation. James makes it perfectly clear that we look no further than ourselves for the problem of temptation. He says this in verse 14 and 15, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it has fully grown, brings forth death. Each person, own desire. Temptation is all around us. As God told Cain, it is always crouching at the door. 
We struggle with it. We feel guilty about our temptations, especially when we fall into them. And we make up our mind to defeat them, don't we? We're, you know, think of, think of a temptation that you struggle with, and, and I just want to see a show of hands. How many of us have thought, I've got to overcome this temptation? Yeah, most all of us. We think we've got to overcome it. We think we have to defeat it. But here's the good here's some news. We cannot defeat it. We are powerless to defeat it. That's verse read verse 2 of a mighty fortress. We cannot defeat it. And we fail every time when we trust ourselves to overcome. And that's exactly what the devil would have us do. He would rather have us oh, he would rather have us trust ourselves and our own strength and our own willpower to overcome our temptation. Because that keeps us from looking to Jesus. The devil wants us to think that we can defeat our the temptations on our own. But the truth is God is here to help us in the midst of our temptations. He brings us good and perfect gifts. He brings us the message, the word of truth. He brings us the gospel. He gives us the sacrament of Jesus' body and blood for the forgiveness of our sins and the strengthening of our faith. God, our gracious Heavenly Father, gave us the best the good and the perfect gift, the gift of his only begotten son. Jesus knows what a trial is. He also knows what a temptation is. He faced him 40 days in the wilderness. Just that one time, he faced them. He faced it in the Garden of Gethsemane when he is te was tempted to walk away from the cross. In fact, he even prayed to God, if there's another way, Heavenly Father, let this cup pass from me. But thankfully, he did not. Thankfully, he ended his prayer, not my will, but thy will be done. Yes, he was tempted not to suffer and die for you and me. But he overcame those temptations. He went to the cross for you and for me to pay for all of the times, to pay for, paid in full, all of the times that you and I fall into temptation. He is the only one who can defeat temptation for us. Open up your hymn book. I want you to look at that hymn verse again. Hymns 5, 6, 657. It is a great verse, such, such truth. Verse two, no, six, hymn 657, verse two, no strength of ours can match his might. We would be lost, rejected. But now a champion comes to fight whom God himself elected. You ask who this may be? The Lord of hosts is he. Christ Jesus, mighty Lord, God's only Son adored. He holds the field victorious. He is the one, not you and me. He is the one who defeated the devil, not you and me. And he overcame those temptations. And, and, and he went to that cross he paid for all of those times that you and I fall into temptation. And he is the only one who can defeat the temptation for us. And you might ask how. I think it's significant in Mark's gospel. Mark doesn't spend any time talking about what Jesus was tempted to do. Or Jesus was, he spends no time talking about Jesus' temptations in detail. All he said was he was tempted. But what's equally interesting is that what he does talk about 
as he does talk about how God provided for our Lord after the temptation was time was over and he talks about what how God equipped Jesus at the beginning time and how God equipped Jesus at the beginning time we hear this message that Jesus was baptized and we hear this that the Spirit descended upon him and as the Spirit descended upon him the heavens opened and uh, we hear, Jesus heard that you are my beloved son and I think Mark was trying to perhaps make a point that what Jesus was tempted to do isn't really the issue he was tempted yes but the instances or the or the certain specifics about the temptation isn't as important as what is important that God was that Jesus was God's beloved son in whom he is well pleased and that is something for all of us to remember that in holy baptism whether water is sprinkled on you or you were immersed makes no difference that the Holy Spirit came upon you and God is saying in heaven that is my son that is my daughter in whom I am well pleased because st. Paul reminds us in Romans chapter 6 that when we are baptized we are united with Jesus in his in his death and in his resurrection so that everything that Jesus endured is credited to us as if we did it. As a matter of fact, think about it this way. Where Adam and Eve failed in the Garden of Eden, and we therefore inherited the punishment for their failure, when Jesus, God's own son, Adam and Eve were it was God's son and daughter in the beginning, and when the new Adam came about, Jesus, God's own son, he was thrust into the wilderness, and where he was tempted by the devil, he succeeded, where Adam and Eve failed. And the fact that you and I are now joined to Jesus in the waters of baptism, as St. Paul tells us we are, we now are credited with all that Jesus accomplished. We now are declared righteous where we were not righteous before. Our problem is, as we keep trying to do it on our own. But listen to what St. Peter says. St. Peter writes, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patient wait, patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which now corresponds to this, now saves you. Not in a removal of the dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Christ, who has gone to heaven and is at the right hand of God with all the angels and authorities and powers having been subjected to him. Because of Jesus Christ, my friends, you are God's children now. You are the first fruits, if you will, of, of, of God and because of what God did for you in the waters of baptism uniting you with Jesus he has now enabled you to stand firm in the confession of faith that you are God's child that nothing at all of creation will ever separate you from his love that if you do succumb to the temptation that he is there quickly and swiftly to forgive you. And that is great news. Never again having to worry, carry guilt, be beset with grief and shame, but rather being joyful that God has forgiven us all of our sin. And today he feeds us with his word. He feeds us with his sacrament. And in this feeding, he strengthens us by giving us promise 
to the promise that he is with us always, giving us his sympathy, his understanding of what we're going through. Why? Because he has been there. God knows all about the wilderness of our trials and tribulations because he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to suffer them as we do so that he can give us everything that we need to overcome them in this world and receive the crown of life that Jesus has earned for us upon the cross. May God bless us during this Lenten season. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, may it guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord.